The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash GZJ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome to Building Better Models for Melanoma Care, Continued Progress with Immunotherapy in Resectable and Unresectable Disease. Tonight's panelists include Dr. Jeff Gibney from the Georgetown Comprehensive Cancer Center and me, Jason Luke, from the UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. So let's move on to our first presentation and discussion, which surrounds a timeline of immunotherapy advances in metastatic melanoma. And the modern era of immunotherapy really began for melanoma in 2011, when the first approval from an immune checkpoint inhibitor came with ipilimumab or anti-CTLA-4 antibody. Now you'll note on the left-hand side that prior to 2011, the one-year overall survival for patients was about 25%. After uh, ipilimumab was approved, we thereafter have had sort of a, a rapid uh, advancement of our field, where in 2014, we had the approval of the anti-PD-1 antibodies, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And the following year, we had approval of the combination of nivolumab with ipilimumab or PD-1 plus CTLA-4 immunotherapy. Also in 2015, we had approval of the first oncolytic uh, virus uh, for cancer therapy called Talamagene Laherparepbec or TVEC. And all of this leads us to our current era where the one year overall survival is now more than 70% for our patients. It's really hard to emphasize um, the extent to which this is a dramatic change for the outcomes and really just uh, an unbelievable benefit for our patients. And uh, we'll come to it in just a minute. Uh, Dr. Gibney and I have been colleagues for a long time. We actually did residency together and I can remember discussions about being interested in, in melanoma and immunotherapy. And at that time, people thought we were crazy for wanting to go into this field because that was dating back to around 2007 to nine. And outcomes, as you can see, were just really so difficult at that time that this was a very difficult disease to treat. And now we're very fortunate that some of our patients live for a long time. But what, why do we need additional advancements for melanoma care? Well, on the left-hand side, you can see the number of new cases uh, that projected for 2021 in the United States with melanoma of the skin um, being approximately 62,000 cases in men uh, and in women being approximately 43, uh, 3 to 44,000 cases. And for patients with distant metastases, uh, five-year survival remains in the range of about 30% for PD-1 monotherapy per uh, SEER data. We can move on for the timeline of immunotherapy advances for resectable uh, melanoma. And so thinking about this then as uh, post-surgical adjuvant therapy or consolidative treatment. And the first checkpoint inhibitor approved in this setting was for adjuvant therapy in 2015. And you can see that again, that was ipilimumab. And prior to 2015, there was a long history of the use of adjuvant therapy based on interferon. And we, I would have to say, fortunately, don't really need to go into that in substantial detail. It was a highly toxic regimen with minimal efficacy. But again, starting in 2015, we introduced checkpoint blockade as a standard approach with ipilimumab. 2017, we saw the approval of nivolumab, and this is for stage three melanoma or resected stage four. And then in 2019, pembrolizumab gained full approval. And really what we'll discuss throughout the rest of this presentation is the potential of these agents both in enhancing further subsets of patients in the post-surgical setting, such as adjuvant therapy for stage two disease, as well as pre-surgical management of melanoma, utilizing neoadjuvant approaches. And so for today's agenda, we'll have clinical consult sessions where we'll really have some discussions around what's the meaning of these data that have come forward and how do they inform our practice on the management of patients with melanoma in various settings. First, we'll have case discussions in metastatic disease from checkpoint inhibitor standards to novel immune-based combinations that are advancing. And second, we'll look at case-based uh, presentations at the present and future of immunotherapy and resectable melanoma. And the first of these will be discussed checkpoint inhibitors in advanced and unresectable melanoma. And we'll discuss a clinical case and I'll introduce it and then I'll, I think, throw it to my uh, colleague uh, to have a sort of feedback on how he might approach this. And so the patient that presents is a woman with metastatic melanoma with predominant disease in the lung as metastases. So Margaret, in this case, a 58-year-old woman with chronic sun exposure who developed stage four melanoma 
Notably, the tumor uh, has a BRAF wild type status. The patient has some comorbidities uh, with hypertension and, and uh, atrial fibrillation. So for discussion then, we have to ask, how would we manage this patient in the frontline setting? Would we give anti-PD-1 monotherapy or the combination of PD-1 plus CTLA-4? And how would that vary if the patient had a BRAF mutated melanoma? So I might start by just asking Dr. Gibney, you know, when thinking about such a patient, what would be the factors that would go into your consideration about your initial treatment choice? So thank you, Jason and Dr. Uh, Dr. Luke. This is a, a very typical presentation that we would see in clinic where patients presenting with metastatic disease involving the lungs, uh, presumptively relatively low tumor burden, not very symptomatic, and you do have multiple treatment options here. The BRAF wild type status indicates her tumor does not harbor the oncogenic BRAF mutation, so the BRAF targeted therapy would not be an option in this scenario. And then the history of hypertension and atrial fibrillation indicates that there is a cardiac history that you have to consider. Uh, in terms of BRAF target therapy, there is the potential for cardiac toxicities, uh, but for immunotherapy, the cardiac to toxicity rates are very low. So that doesn't play into our decision uh, process too much for talking about anti-PD-1 based therapies. Uh, so the low tumor burden patients, BRAF wild type, asymptomatic, this is where it becomes a discussion where patients should start with anti-PD-1 monotherapy or use the current standard combination therapy of anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4. The, the data that we reference most often is the Checkmate 067 study, where in patients that have BRAF wild type disease, the, the gain uh, is pretty modest at best between the combination and the monotherapy. And some individuals prefer one versus the other, uh, in general, my preference has been combination strategy, but I think the PD-1 monotherapy route would be perfectly fine. Yeah, so that's, that's really great insights. Um, you know, some things that I would add to that um, would be that uh, there's um, pretty strong data, all retrospective, obviously, but that uh, for um, pulmonary-based metastases particularly are especially sensitive to anti-PD-1. And in that case, um, that tends to be somewhere where I tend to use a monotherapy. So um, it'll be no surprise that... Uh, Jeff and I like to sort of uh, argue with each other a little bit here on this, but uh, you know, in such a case here, uh, I actually might defer to monotherapy. And I think this probably goes to the, you know, familiarity of, of, uh, of docs with these different agents and the, you know, particular subsets they like to use them in. Obviously the patient may have some say in which of these treatments they would want to use as well. Because I think the major differentiator here uh, between these regimens um, is, you know, likely to be the toxicity profile, which is quite substantially different where there's a much higher rate of immune related adverse events for patients who prefer combination regimens. And so here, uh, there's really no right or wrong answer. I think one piece of information that we might wanna pursue here would be the uh, lactate dehydrogenase, uh, because I think if I were to see that that were to be elevated, then I might actually defer kind of more to the considerations like Dr. Gibney had, where we would take a slightly more aggressive approach. But if it was a normal LDH and pulmonary metastases, in my clinic, I might start with anti-PD-1 monotherapy as a generally well-tolerated treatment, um, you know, with pretty high upside in that, in that setting. But again, no right or wrong in this area. And I think um, variations in practice very, um, can, can, can be, um, you know, I wouldn't say substantial, but can include uh, different approaches in the front line. So I'm going to go on then and talk about some, some data to underpin these uh, decisions. And, uh, you know, we'll just emphasize that PD-1 monotherapy is highly effective in metastatic disease. And you can see on the left-hand side that PD-1 monotherapy and metastatic melanoma in terms of nivolumab has been described from the Checkmate 066 study uh, as having a five-year uh, follow-up with OS in the range of, on a median, about 37.3 months. And this was a clinical trial, the 066 study, as we refer to it, comparing nivolumab with the carbazine clinical, chair, uh, clinical um, chemotherapy, excuse me. And so um, again, you can see that really substantial improvement in OS. So you can't really emphasize how much of a difference there is there between immunotherapy and chemotherapy. And as well, the five-year overall survival rates, again, with immunotherapy being at about 40%, 39%, compared with uh, chemotherapy being at 17%. And obviously, this is a very statistically significant and clinically meaningful difference. And so there's really no question that you would use immunotherapy and not chemotherapy. And in fact, in melanoma, I would say it's fairly rare, actually, that we even use chemotherapy anymore. It's not that we never use it, but I think only really in, in niche uh, considerations. So... Um, uh, Pembrolizumab obviously is also a standard of care, uh, and based on the Keynote 006 study, which you see on the left-hand side, which was also a randomized phase three trial, 
uh, with 57.7 months of follow-up, you can see the overall survival on median there was 32.7 months. Again, compared with ipilimumab in this clinical trial at 15.9 months. And again, that's a pretty you know, substantial improvement. And so uh, I don't think this is much of an issue anymore, but it's really the case that ipilimumab monotherapy is really not a standard of care in the frontline treatment of melanoma. One might even argue that it's not a standard of care in the second line, although that kind of gets beyond the scope of, where, of this patient's considerations, obviously. And so these are the recommendations in terms of guidelines regarding um, uh, treatment of patients uh, in consideration with and without the BRAF status. So you can see in the first line setting that both anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-1 plus CTLA-4 blockade are both category one recommendations for BRAF wild type disease. You can see on the bottom left there that for patients with BRAF mutation, then obviously consideration around the use of BRAF inhibitor is also reasonable. And that just introduces more complexity in terms of um, you know, which patient, uh, treatments do patients uh, prefer uh, when uh, considering uh, that frontline approach in terms of long-term efficacy, convenience of treatment, route of administration, toxicities, et cetera. And you can see in the second line that you know, there's uh, considerations around similar questions around um, you know, if you used PD-1 monotherapy, would you want to go to a combination in the second, round, uh, second line? And there's now um, you know, retrospective and prospective data in the phase two setting that support that sort of an approach. And then obviously still, if there's a BRAF mutation, you also might want to use such a treatment given that there's an association with overall survival in the front line. So a number of different options, and I think really applying these to your individual patient based on your comfort level and theirs um, really is the way to optimize uh, outcomes for such patients. So let's go on to a second consult. Um, in this patient now, it's still Margaret, but we've changed her circumstances slightly. And you can see now that in addition to lung metastases, Margaret has stage four disease involving brain metastases. And you can see that otherwise she has similar uh, clinical characteristics. And so I guess then I'd ask to Dr. Gibney, you know, in considering this, I think I know the answer already, but, uh, you know, so which of the treatments, PD-1 mono versus combo, would you think about giving such a patient? Sure. And, and this is not a too uncommon scenario where we see brain metastases diagnosed up front, uh, probably in the ballpark of about 10% based on some of the data we've seen, but overall up to about 40% of patients historically have had brain metastases with advanced melanoma. The uh, data has shown that both anti-PD-1 and the PD-1-CTLA-4 combination have activity in brain metastases. However, the PD-1-CTLA-4 combination has shown higher response rates, uh, better PFS and OS than we've seen with PD-1 monotherapy. This comes from the ABC study as well as the 204 study. And that really has set the stage as PD-1-CTLA-4 as the standard for patients with active brain metastases. Yeah. I would follow up to the second that I think the data for those two uh, seminal studies that you described really just is uh, outstanding. So we're talking about patients who in a previous era had very poor outcomes. You know, their, their life expectancies were six months to nine months. And in the updated ASCO for the ABC trial, now with five-year outcomes, we see that even in patients with brain metastases who get nivolumab plus ipilimumab, 50% of the patients are still alive. Uh, I think I, that's amazing. You, you stop and think about that. So uh, I, I can't emphasize that one enough. In a patient like this with brain metastases, asymptomatic, it, it really would be a standard of care to give nivolumab plus ipilimumab. Now that will require that you reckon with the toxicity profile, there's no question, but with that substantial difference between a response rate in the 20s versus 50, that, that's a big deal. And I, I think there are very few patients where I would give monotherapy in a scenario like this. Now, if there's a BRAF mutation, it can be slightly more complicated. But even there, I think immunotherapy in such a patient definitely should be our first go-to. Uh, you know, Dr. Gibney alluded to that 10% who present with asymptomatic brain metastases in the front line. I guess I just ask quick, I mean, that's not the most common though, right? So a lot of our patients who present with brain metastases actually, you know, are not asymptomatic. So how, how do you think about that? So I think every patient who um, has newly diagnosed stage four disease really should be screened for asymptomatic brain metastases. Um, but you're right. So uh, patients often will present with symptomatic brain metastases uh, rather than asymptomatic. And that does change the management strategy a bit because a lot of those patients will require either surgery, radiation, and probably steroids. Steroids, uh, we think, may dampen the responses to anti-PD-1-based therapies. Uh, and the data that we've seen for symptomatic patients uh, using immune checkpoint therapy has not been terribly exciting, that the efficacy is much, much less than we've seen in the asymptomatic population. In those patients, if a BRAF mutation exists, uh, that may be the better starting point with a, a combination strategy based on 
uh, the dobrafenib trametinib data that we've seen. Although response rates high, the durability is not there. So this is not typically a long-term strategy for patients, but maybe an appropriate starting place for them. Yeah, absolutely. So when I think about patients who, you know, unfortunately are more common who present with symptomatic brain metastases, meaning some edema or shift or, you know, something, uh, the way I think about that is how do we get this patient to the place where they could get ipinevo? And so that commonly does include an upfront use of BRAF inhibitors because they work very rapidly, right? But just as you alluded to, the durability of those responses, unfortunately, is not what we're really looking for. And so uh, I would really emphasize that point that, um, you know, really in brain meds, what we want to try to get the patient is a, a, a realistic shot at getting ipinevo while not on steroids, because those steroids do appear to be quite detrimental when used initially when starting anti-PD-1. Um, and so it's, it's also pretty clear that when patients get toxicity, you should use the steroids as quickly as you can to get that toxicity under wraps. And that does not dampen the long-term outcomes. It's really if the steroids are on board when you start the treatment that causes a lot of the problem. So that's great. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to just uh, review an update that we saw at the ASCO annual meeting, I guess the virtual meeting, uh, 2021, our last virtual meeting, I hope. Um, around uh, Checkmate 067, uh, just to discuss these data and again, to emphasize how relevant they are really to our standard practice. So all of you will remember this clinical trial, the seminal study uh, published in the New England Journal now four to uh, three times, I think, uh, maybe four coming up soon. Um, and, and what was done in this trial was uh, comparing two different uh, statistical considerations. The first was to compare PD-1 monotherapy with nivolumab versus ipilimumab. So on the uh, Kaplan-Meier plot here, you'll see that's the green line versus the purple or black line at the bottom. Another statistical consideration was nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus ipilimumab. And you see that as the red versus the bottom uh, purple black line. And so um, again, realizing that this uh, study dates back several years to like 2014, at the time this study started, PD-1 antibodies were not yet approved. So when we look at this study retrospectively, we sort of scratch our head and say like, why did we compare, why didn't we compare the two nivolumab containing arms, and it just, that wasn't the era that we were in. Uh, but for the purposes of this update, what I wanted to highlight is you can see now the overall survival on this plot dating, going out now to six and a half years. And you can see that on the right-hand side. And what you'll note is that the overall survival for the nivolumab plus ipilimumab combination is still right around 50%. So at 78 months, six and a half years, it finally dips under the median at 49%. But again, just think about that for a second. Um, for those of us, you know, who grew up in a different era, uh, dating back to, like I said, 20 to 2009 to 2012, these patients had a median life expectancy of nine to 12 months. Now we're talking about half of them alive at five years. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely fantastic for our patients. And, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's so gratifying to have seen this change over time. And I don't, I don't know, Jeff, if you have comments about that. Um, I, I just remember being as a fellow and, you know, still wrapping these horrendous, you know, you know, cutaneous in transit lesions that we couldn't get a handle on. We're resecting stuff all over the place. I don't know. Do you have any remembrances of that time? Of course. It's, um, I, I remember when Ipilumab first uh, came on the market and that was an option for patients. And when it worked, it was great, but we still were struggling in the majority of patients. And then came along anti-PD-1 drugs. We knew that they were showing great benefit in clinical trials. And there was a, a lag before we had FDA approval in particular for the combination. So there was that period where we were um, still struggling with patients knowing that these drugs were coming. And now that they're here, it's just amazing what we're able to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And so we'll just uh, quickly uh, you know, go over a couple of elements. We've already alluded to the toxicity profile of nivolumab plus ipilimumab. And I think to emphasize that now with uh, this long-term follow-up, what we see is that the toxicity profile really is not different than what we already understood. And so that, that's reassuring that there are no new sig uh, signals. And what you can see on the, on the um, table here is that on the left-hand side, you see combination immunotherapy with nivolumab and ipilimumab. And I'd highlight in the second from the left, um, I guess second to the right from the left, uh, <laughs> grade three, four events at 59% for patients who get the combo. And that, that is a, a substantial clinical burden. And I think that really is what drives some of our decision-making about whether or not to use this regimen. And part of the reason I pin this is we're going to discuss some data coming up for a new combination immunotherapy regimen where we see a much improved toxicity profile. So keep that in mind that more than half of patients who get Nevo plus IPI with the standard dosing are getting those high degrees of toxicity. Relative to in the middle, you see that the rates of grade three, four events are around 24%. So, you know, less than half of that. 
And so uh, just real quick um, to highlight a couple of other data points uh, we alluded to already. So uh, here you see the ABC trial, which was a uh, phase two clinical trial run out of uh, Australia, specifically in patients with brain metastases. And we won't belabor this because we already alluded to some of this data when discussing our case, but you can see that the rates on the, on the table of clinical response are, are quite outstanding, again, in this uh, asymptomatic brain metastasis population with an intracranial response rate at 59%. And then overall survival on the Kaplan-Meier uh, plot on the bottom, you know, noting landmarks at 12 and then 36 and then 60 months, where at five years, you see 51% of patients who've got the combination are still alive. And again, we already discussed it, so I won't belabor it further, but it's pretty amazing. Um, and it's not good enough because that means 49% are not alive, but, you know, that just shows the work we still have to do, but the fact that we have been making progress. And so um, I think um, in thinking then about rethinking uh, Margaret's initial presentation, uh, I wonder, Jeff, then uh, considering any of this, any further comments about, uh, you know, which of these you might uh, consider, uh, noting that in the discussion here at the bottom, uh, we're transitioning here because we've got PD-1 mono, we talked about PD-1 CTLA-4 combo, but now what about new combos? And, uh, you know, I think uh, we won't let the cat out of the bag until you discuss it, but uh, any, any comments here about uh, where the field's going? Sure, and you alluded it to it in uh, the earlier discussion where anti-PD-1 monotherapy has good activity in this type of patient. However, response rates still are not 100%, and patients don't always respond. So this is a patient where you're, you're trying not to expose them to a high level of, of toxicity, but you would want more efficacy out of your regimen. And, and that's where the concern about whether you do give PD-1 CTLA-4 or not, where the toxicity does come into play. Um, other regimens where we might have combination strategies with more efficacy and not significantly more uh, toxicity would be ideal in this scenario. And that's where we hope the PD-1 lag-3 is, is starting to play out and might be a nice fit for this type of patient in the future. Absolutely. So maybe I'll hand it over to you then to kind of take us forward and tell us about lag-3. Well, thank you, Dr. Luke. Uh, so we've talked mainly about PD-1 and CTLA-4. These are the immune, checkpoint, um, immune checkpoints that are on T cells as well as other cells, and they uh, modulate the way the T cells function. They lead to exhaustion uh, or inactivation, but they're not the only markers that are on T cells that have this ability to either activate or inhibit T cell function. And looking at this list, you can see that there are quite a number of other targets for us to consider. Most of these are under drug development for targeting, whether it's OX40, Gitter, uh, TIM3. We have seen uh, some clinical activity presented at our national meetings with agents going after these targets. Uh, but where we've seen some of the more exciting data is LAG3. LAG3 uh, is a marker that inhibits uh, T cell function or, or leads to T cell exhaustion. And by blocking it, hopefully you can invigorate a T cell response. So the uh, mechanism where we might see some uh, dramatic improvement is where we combine lag three to PD-1. And this slide really demonstrates the, the concept, the strategy here, where lag three regulates the T cell function. And this is in patients that potentially are immunotherapy naive or have progressed on an anti-PD-1 or IO regimen. Uh, the effector CD4, CD8 T cell function um, may be dampened when the T cell has PD-1 and lag three expression that's upregulated. And as you can see in this diagram, PD-1 interacts with PD-L1 on the tumor. LAG-3 will interact with MHC class 2. When you have that interaction, you have dampening of T cell function and leading to exhaustion or inactivation. Monoclonal antibodies, including nivolumab and rilatlimab, can block both the PD-1 and LAG-3 on the T cells, leading to reinvigoration of the immune response. And this is potentially a strategy in IO therapy naive patients, as well as in the IO refractory patients, and we've seen data for both. Uh, what we're now very excited about was the presentation at ASCO 2021 of relatlimab plus nivolumab in metastatic melanoma. This is the relativity study 047 trial. It was a very large trial. Uh, it had two phases where it initially started as a phase two randomized design, and then phase three uh, global uh, study the key eligibility were previously untreated, unresectable or metastatic melanoma patients, had to have a good performance status of zero to one. And then there was a four tier stratification for LAG3 PDL1 expression, BRAF mutation within the tumor, and then AJCC eighth edition M stage. Uh, 714 patients ultimately enrolled in a one to one ratio. Uh, 
the relatlimab was given as a flat dose, 160 milligrams, and nivolumab at a flat dose of 480 milligrams uh, intravenous every four weeks. And this was compared to nivolumab 480 milligrams IV every four weeks. Keep in mind, this was a double blind study. So patients and investigators did not know what the treatment was that was administered to patients. Primary endpoint is PFS by blind independent central review. Secondary endpoints, overall survival and objective response rate. So the, the data that was presented was primarily the PFS data. And what we've seen is that there is more than a doubling of the medium PFS when we look at nivolumab monotherapy, median PFS of 4.63, uh, the combination strategy 10.12. So a very dramatic improvement in the median PFS, hazard ratio of 0.75 and a significant p-value. What I think is more impressive are the PFS Kaplan-Meier curves, where you see at 12 months, uh, roughly 48% are progression-free compared to 36, and the curves do remain separated as it uh, goes further out. Censoring does happen pretty quickly, so the curves aren't very reliable beyond the 18-month mark. But still, this is a very early signal that looks exciting for us, uh, where we see uh, potentially uh, significant improvement with the combination strategy. What was thought is that the combination might be a good strategy for subgroups of patients, but maybe not all patients. And the subgroup analysis in the study looked very promising, actually, for all subgroups. In this forest plot, you can see that really all the hazard ratios are off to the left. Off to the left indicates that the, um, the outcomes were favored for PFS with the combination of relatlimab plus nivolumab. This is particularly important for the LAG3 and PDL1 expression, as well as M stage. Uh, patients with higher level disease benefited from the combination. Uh, patients who had high and low PDL1 expression appeared to benefit with the combination. And those with high and low lag three expression appear to benefit with the combination. So the other key point that we saw uh, in the presentation was the treatment related adverse events. In the nivolumab monotherapy arm, the grade three, four events were relatively low, 9.7% of patients compared to roughly 19% of patients in the combination strategy. Uh, now, as we have further maturation of the data, uh, we might see that these rates change, but clearly seeing a combination strategy with a grade three, four adverse event rate of roughly 19%, that looks quite promising. That's very exciting for us. Uh, this is not much different than what we've seen for monotherapy in some of the other studies. Also, when you look at the breakdown for the treatment related adverse events, it's very similar to what you see with monotherapy. Uh, there's not a, a clear outlier that makes you very concerned. Uh, so the strategy looks very promising with only a small increase in the treatment-related adverse event rate. So in terms of practical considerations, we see a statistically significant uh, improvement in the PFS. And to us as uh, treating providers, we think this is likely very clinically meaningful. And the toxicity profile, again, looks very manageable. If you compare it to the anti-PD-1 CTLA-4 regimen, it's substantially less. So for investigators like ourselves here, we're very excited looking at these results. Some of the questions come up is how do you manage toxicity going forward if this does get FDA approval? Uh, and we have to keep in mind this is an immune checkpoint therapy, so we would handle it at least um, at the current state of things as we would with PD-1 and CTLA-4. There may be more guidance that comes out as it gets FDA approved and we see the, the unpackaged labeling, uh, but in general, you would want a whole drug and use some of the same uh, approaches with high-dose corticosteroids for patients that have severe immune-related events. Uh, Rechallenging is really a question that we don't have a, an answer to yet. The patients with significant toxicity on a LAG-3 drug, can you rechallenge them? Or do you have to follow similar rules with PD-1 and CTLA-4? That will have to be determined as we, we go forward. Now, who are the patients that we really would focus on for this type of strategy? Uh, we do think that relatlimab and nivolumab could become the new standard of care for patients that you otherwise would have given anti-PD-1 monotherapy. This is a, a scenario such as in our patient, a 58-year-old female with stage 4 disease and lung meds, no brain metastases. So this could be a good regimen in that type of patient. But then there are going to be patients that we probably would prefer to use a more aggressive strategy with nevo uh, We do not have head-to-head -head comparative, comparative data, so we do have to be careful uh, applying all of um, the data from the relativity 047 
study to other populations. So in patients that are rapid progressors, high LDH, uh, extensive disease, including brain metastases, we have very strong data for mevoipi. So this is a patient where we uh, may favor that regimen. We also know patients who progress on adjuvant PD-1 or even PD-1 monotherapy in the metastatic setting that we can see very good responses with anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4 uh, therapy. Dr. Luke and colleagues um, had a very nice study with pembrolizumab and ipilimumab in this setting, so in, showing salvage rates can be quite impressive still in patients who progress on PD-1 therapy. So the PD-1 CTLA-4 strategy would probably make sense in this uh, population. And then lastly, for patients who have severe autoimmune disease, we still don't know um, if uh, LAG3, targeting LAG3 would cause a flare in their autoimmune disease as we have seen with CTLA-4 and PD-1, but presumptively it could. So this might be a scenario where you still would consider using anti-PD-1 therapy alone. And uh, until we have more data, that's probably where I think most of us would sit. So I don't know, Dr. Luke, if you have any other thoughts on, on those three populations. Yeah, no, I think you outlined it you know, quite well. Um, I, I, think the, the, I think the key takeaways that I've been seeing uh, about this data is just how impressive they are for progression-free survival, but how sort of unique it is to be considered a new therapy only knowing the progression-free survival. And so <laughs> before we kind of go overboard and get too excited about it, I want to say, you know, we know a lot, you know, six and a half years worth of ipinevo. And I think for our patients who are really at high risk, I would be cautious about completely changing the paradigm you know, based on this initial report. I, I'm very hopeful that as these data mature, we can become more confident about those things. But again, when we think about delivering, you know, the best treatment for each patient, uh, I would be cautious about just jumping immediately to say that this is the combo for everybody. But I think you did a great job kind of outlining how that would, you know, potentially be applicable. Um, you know, one thing just real quick is um, I, you, you mentioned the curves. And I, one thing I wanted to highlight talking about the Kaplan-Meier plots is when you look on the left-hand side, this was an odd trial in that it was this gated phase two, phase three study. So what you see is that way out on the curves, on the right-hand side, there's a whole bunch of dots of patients who are still on the study. And you look kind of in the middle, and then there's like not so many patients on the study. And then on the left-hand side, there's a whole bunch of patients on the study again. And that's because there was a long pause in the middle of the study to evaluate the phase two data before they proceeded to phase three. And the reason I'm saying all this is it might sound like clinical trial minutia, but what it means is we're going to learn a lot about some of these patients over the next, say, year or two, because all those people on the left-hand side who are censored, well, they're all going to eventually kind of flow through the system. And, you know, we would presume that this data will look exactly like this over time, but, you know, we, we've presumed a lot of things in oncology, so we're going to kind of need to see kind of where this all goes. Um, you know, the one other comment I was going to make about this was uh, when we compare across studies, which, you know, dogmatically we're not supposed to do, and yet that's like the whole thing that we do in these kinds of CME things, um, is um, if you look at the landmarks, um, it, it sort of looks initially like the patients in this clinical trial did more poorly than what they had done historically on Checkmate 067. Um, but it's important to point out that that's not actually statistically accurate. We don't actually know whether or not that's true. And, uh, you know, uh, Jeff, you mentioned the, um, the use of the bicker or blinded independent central radiology. So that technique of having radiologists look at the scans on this trial relative to the 047 was different than what was done on Checkmate 067. And so on that study, the investigators got to look at when they thought progression happened. And um, I think maybe it's because we love our patients so much, but we're notoriously uh, a little late, a little tardy on, on calling progression on our patients. So it's very well, it could be the case that these numbers actually are identical. And that, you know, if we actually had blinded independent review on 067, they would end up looking very similar. And as the data get more mature, it'll be very interesting to kind of look like, see what that looks like kind of over time. So, but yeah, I would completely agree that I think that this is definitely a new standard regimen for many patients. Um, and it'll really just be, you know, how do we adjudicate that in terms of risk, in terms of understanding and how patients feel confident about it, you know, over time. So, uh, Thank you, Dr. Luke, and I, I fully agree. Those are very good points, and it, it is very unusual to be analyzing a study like this without having at least objective response rate and, and some of those other points with the censoring. Uh, so, so many patients up front in the <laughs> timeline here, so we'll have to see how this all plays out. And I know you're going to be presenting on the new adjuvant lag 3 uh, PD-1 strategy, which at least gives us an idea of what the response rate might look like from this study. Uh, the uh, the other combination strategy that um, I think is 
at least very interesting, and we'll have to see where this uh, emerges in the landscape of melanoma therapies, is a combination of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKIs, plus PD-1 therapy. Uh, this is uh, in particular for lymbatinib plus pembrolizumab in melanoma. We know that uh, VEGF, FGFR, um, other um, angiogenesis pathways actually can lead to a, an immune suppressive tumor microenvironment. Uh, and uh, that can be both on T cell exhaustion, uh, that can be on the antigen presentation or dendritic cells. Uh, we can see an increase in tumor uh, associated macrophages. And then directly on the tumor cell, uh, these signaling pathways actually can suppress some of the normal uh, T cell recruitment signals, uh, the chemokines uh, that can be generated with interferon gamma signaling. So when we inter interact or in uh, block these pathways, such as with lovatinib that blocks VEGFR as well as FGFR, you can inhibit these pathways to augment the immune environment and hopefully create a more favorable immune environment. And if you come in with another uh, immunotherapy agent, such as an anti-PD-1 drug, you'll see the two work together to improve responses in various models. Uh, there have been a number of studies using syngenetic mouse models with tumors uh, where the, the mice have intact immune systems. And we've seen that the combination of lymvatinib and other TKI strategies with anti-PD-1 drug improves tumor control. And in this example here with the CT26 mouse model, you can see that the best tumor control was in the combination of lymvatinib plus anti-PD-1 compared to the monotherapy and vehicle arms. So this really leads to the suggestion that this is a strategy that might be more effective in patients. Uh, we've seen clinically good outcomes in patients with uh, RCC, hepatocellular carcinoma, as well as endometrial cancer with this type of strategy. And it's now moved into a focus of advanced melanoma patients, particularly in those patients that have progressed on anti-PD-1 drugs. Now, the LEAP-004 study was presented in update at ASCO. And uh, it, to give you a background of it, it's the unresectable stage three or stage four population. Patients had progression of disease uh, within or on 12 weeks of last anti-PD-1 drug. So this is a fairly tight population. And patients uh, could have received anti-CTLA-4 therapy, but were not technically required. There was no limit to prior therapies and patients were required to have measurable disease. Roughly hundred patients were enrolled. Patients were treated all with the same regimen. This was pembrolizumab flat dosing at 200 milligrams IV every three weeks in combination with lumvatinib, 20 milligrams by mouth every day and the therapy was continued until progression to or toxicity. Uh, the response data, we saw objective responses in 21% of patients and the disease control rate of 66%. Uh, there were few complete responses, uh, but if you look at the duration of response or the ongoing response Kaplan-Meier curve off to the right, you can see that at six months, 77% of patients um, were still maintaining the response and then at nine months, 39%. This is a little difficult to interpret, and you really have to put it into context of other strategies using TKIs like lymbatinib. We know lymbatinib has monotherapy activity, somewhere probably between 5 and 10%. Um, and then there have been other lymbatinib plus chemotherapy studies that have shown response rates in the ballpark of 20%. What we don't think likely has happened in the past is, is the durability of response. And for me, the most important part of this study is to see where this tail of the response curve lays. Is it going to continue to stay flat at uh, roughly 39% with further follow-up, or will this continue to fall where basically all patients who had an upfront response ultimately progress? And to me, until we see that data, it's hard for, to really know where this will fall out. Uh, the other important part is the treatment-related adverse events. Uh, we do see a, a higher rate of treatment-related adverse events, grade three to five, compared to PD-1 monotherapy when the combination strategy is used. In this study, it was 46%. Uh, and if you look at the dose interruption, over half of patients did require dose interruption, and 8% uh, of patients required discontinuation of drug. The frequency of events is similar to what we would expect from other lymbatinib as well as anti-PD-1 uh, studies. Uh, the highest incidence of um, adverse events were seen in hypertension, diarrhea, nausea, and in particular, hypothyroidism was, was relatively high at 33% compared to other anti-PD-1 strategies. Uh, from other lymvatinib, pembrolizumab studies, these toxicities have been relatively manageable, but we have to keep in mind how they compare to 
other melanoma studies. And one of the other presentations I just wanted to uh, bring to the attention of the group here is that uh, autologous tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy or TIL therapy, advanced melanoma, uh, does look very promising, is hopefully moving forward uh, eventually with FDA approval in the future. Uh, this is where a tumor is excised from a patient. The T cells that are in the tumor are expanded in the laboratory and tested for reactivity against the patient's own melanoma. Uh, once that step has been completed and the T cells are reactive, they're expanded, uh, usually expanded into the billions, a uh, patient is then brought into uh, the treatment center or hospital where they receive um, non-myeloblative chemotherapy, usually cyclophosphamide for darabine. They get their TIL therapy infusion, and then that's followed by IL-2 administration, in this study, up to six doses. Uh, in the cohort two of, the, of uh, this uh, lusolifolifolifolusol uh, study, <laughs> uh, patients uh, were PD-1 refractory, plus minus anti-CTLA-4, as well as BRAF MEK inhibitor refractory, if they harbored a BRAF mutation. And uh, a response rate, objective response rate of 36% was seen. Interestingly, there's no median duration of response yet. Now, this is in part due to this still being a fairly young study, but it's also that the responses we think are very durable and long lasting. Keep in mind, this is a one-time treatment for patients in general. And we've seen historical data in the past in the PD-1 naive or uh, unexposed patients where this is uh, very durable lasting years, if not permanent. So hopefully this becomes available for patients as a standard regimen in the future. So some take home points on the progress of immunotherapy and metastatic melanoma. Based on the relativity 047 study, relatlimab and nivolumab, we think could replace PD-1 monotherapy in most settings that are standard of care. We do wanna see uh, more data before uh, we make that final call, but it's looking very promising. We do have to keep in mind that the field is shifting, that we have anti-PD-1 therapy approved in the adjuvant setting. A lot of our metastatic melanoma patients present with stage three disease, it's resected and then are offered anti-PD-1 drug. So patients that are now stage four or unresectable um, typically have been exposed to anti-PD-1 therapy. And where will regimens such as relatlimab plus nivolumab fall in in those settings is still yet to be determined. There's novel approaches that are clearly coming. We talked about TIL therapy and VEGF inhibitors plus immune checkpoint therapy, but there are other novel agents on the horizon. That includes TLR9 agonists, IL-12 and TIGIT inhibitors. So there's clearly a lot of development that's exciting. And in the upcoming years, we do expect to have more agents that we can offer patients. So that was a great overview, Jeff. I think it's just really exciting about how much drug development and uh, is ongoing in melanoma, and it's really exciting about the future of having so many agents, you know, potentially in the pipeline. So, given those considerations, um, you know, we alluded to the use of uh, adjuvant therapy or post-surgical therapy, and I wonder if you want to take us into uh, sort of that realm. Well, thank you, Dr. Luke, and yes. Yeah, so the field really is also evolving in two directions, both the metastatic as well as patients with resectable melanoma. And we're gonna focus on constructing a new model for resectable melanoma using an immunotherapy cornerstone. So starting off with the case, a uh, clinical consult, Michael presents with stage 3B melanoma. He's a 68 year old gentleman, the melanoma is on his back. Uh, biopsy shows it's three millimeters in depth, Clark level four, one mitosis and ulcerated uh, status. A wide excision and central lymph node biopsy is performed. The central lymph node is positive for multiple small deposits, but together it's only one millimeter in size. Uh, this would be considered a micrometastatic disease scenario. Cumulatively, he's stage 3B. Uh, this would be T3B and 1A, and his tumor is sequenced in its BRAF wild type. So for purposes of discussion, uh, this type of patient is adjuvant therapy now a go-to option. And I'd like to pass the discussion first to Dr. Luke to get his thoughts. So this is, a, you know, this is a common patient that we see in our clinic. Um, and so you know, I think this is a, a, a extended discussion with the patient about the pros and the cons of treatment. Uh, I would say broadly speaking, I think most of us in the field would definitely offer adjuvant therapy with an anti-PD-1 antibody to such a patient. But it's really important to understand a few things, which um, I'll just point out is that um, you know, most patients in this scenario actually probably already cured, right? Now, uh, adjuvant PD-1 has a substantial um, ability to improve the relapse-free survival. So I think there's a major benefit there, but there's also a toxicity profile that patients have to understand and that in the adjuvant setting, I sometimes say to patients, we'll never know if it worked 
we'll only know if it doesn't work. And how do you consider that in the context of, you know, the toxicity you're willing to entertain? So I would say in such a patient with freebie, absolutely. I think I probably treat most of these people, but we really want to have a nuanced consideration about them, but with them about, um, you know, the pros and the cons of that treatment. Doctor, I think that's a very fair way to look at it. And I look at a very similar uh, scenario that anti-PD-1 therapy for stage 3B, 3B patients certainly indicated you would want to offer it to most patients unless there's a true contraindication, but it does have to be weighed with the, the actual benefit that that patient would receive and then the potential risks. Uh, particularly some of the immune uh, toxicities that we can see, the patient may recover, but have some sequelae. So if the patient was never to re recur, you know, unfortunately now they might be left with a, a long-term issue that they now have to cope with. So looking at the, the data, uh, single agent anti-PD-1 therapy is now standard of care. Uh, it's uh, approved for st stage three resected melanoma patients. In the old era up to 2009, really the focus was high dose interferon, a number of studies as well as low dose interferon and pegylate interferon. Um, but even during that era, there was still a lot of controversy whether we would offer to patients and which patients we would based on the, the modest uh, efficacy that was seen. Really starting in 2015, uh, we had a new era of immune checkpoint therapy that was available in the adjuvant setting. This first off was with ipilimumab, uh, where in randomized phase three data, we saw an improvement over placebo, a hazard ratio of, of 0 0.75, leading to FDA approval in 2015. Uh, then nivolumab uh, versus ipilimumab in a randomized phase three study showing a hazard ratio of 0 0.65. So an active control arm, and yet the anti-PD-1 drug still showed uh, statistical improvement. And this led to FDA approval in 2017. Then we had two other regimens. Uh, this included BRAF-targeted therapy of dibrafenib-trametinib, um, has a ratio of 0.47. Keep in mind, this is only in the BRAF mutant B600 population and approval in 2018, as well as pembrolizumab FDA approval after we saw an, an improvement uh, against a placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.57 in randomized phase three data. Uh, this led to FDA approval in 2019. Uh, looking at some of the updates for this data, the Checkmate 238 study, the 48 month relapse re uh, recurrence free survival showed that we continued to have separation of the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, at 48 months, 52% in the treatment arm with nivolumab, um, we're still doing quite well without recurrence compared to 41% uh, in the patients that received ipilimumab. A uh, hazard ratio of 0 0.71 uh, was maintained that's statistically uh, significant. In the ERTC 1325 Keynote 054 study, we had a new relapse free uh, survival data that uh, was updated. Uh, we see a continuation of the separation of the curves, pembrolizumab versus placebo. And at the 36 month mark, 64% of patients uh, were recurrence free and alive compared to 44% that were uh, receiving placebo. It has a ratio of 0 0.56. Uh, in this study, uh, there was also the interesting component where patients that were in the placebo arm were then uh, pre-designed uh, to cross over to receive uh, pembrolizumab. So it was really asking the question, is it better to receive uh, anti-PD-1 therapy at the onset um, after surgery to prevent a recurrence or wait to see if you have a recurrence and then offer it to the patient? Perhaps the outcomes long-term would be very similar. And this study uh, did have um, 155 patients that were in the placebo arm that crossed over. The three-year PFS rate was 32%, medium uh, progression-free, um, survival was 8.5 months, uh, and not here on the slide, but the objective response rate was just a hair under 40%. This looks fairly similar to what we see for patients with active disease treatment naive, um, although it still requires more follow-up, it's a little difficult to make head-to-head -head comparisons to that population. And while it's very intriguing, and it is part of our discussion with patients, I can't say that it's truly changed our, our uh, treatment recommendations for patients, given the significant hazard ratios offering anti-PD-1 therapy in the adjuvant setting. Uh, the other important part is that using anti-PD-1 therapy in patients that have har tumors harbor a BRAF mutation or that are BRAF wild type, we see significant improvement uh, compared to placebo hazard ratios still favoring pembrolizumab, whether there's BRAF mutant or wild type disease. And we saw very similar outcomes in the Checkmate uh, 238 study for nivolumab as well.
So what's next for adjuvant anti-PD-1 therapy in stage two disease? Currently, there's no FDA approval for this. However, we know that patients with stage 2B and st stage 2C have high risk of recurrence and high mortality rates uh, for, uh, with relapsed disease. If you look at the AJCC 8th edition data, the five-year and 10-year survivals uh, for three, uh, 2B was 87 and 82%, and for stage 2C, it was 82 and 75%. This is uh, implying that there are a large portion of patients that do have relapse and ultimately may die from their disease. Fortunately, we now have ongoing trials in this population. There's two uh, trials of note. Uh, the Keynote 716 study, as well as the Checkmate 76K. This is studying anti-PD-1 monotherapy, pembrolizumab on the Keynote side, and nivolumab on the Checkmate study uh, in patients that have resected 2B and 2C study, uh, disease. Um, both were randomized against placebo. Of note, the Keynote study was a one-to-one -one randomization. The Checkmate is two-to-one. Uh, accrual is still ongoing for the Checkmate study. We have yet to see data for either study. It may be some time before we do, but this is exciting uh, to be able to offer patients currently uh, on protocol and hopefully in the future if these are uh, demonstrating benefit for patients in the long run. So going back uh, to our patient, our clinical discussion, what if Michael was younger and presented with stage three disease? So um, he has a six millimeter uh, depth melanoma, Clark four, uh, five, five mitoses, no ulceration, so a, a more aggressive primary uh, lesion. There's no past medical history that's significant that you'd be concerned for toxicity issues. And he has palpable lymph nodes on exam uh, in the draining lymph node basin and it's pet avid. There's no signs of metastatic disease. Would this patient be a potential candidate for neoadjuvant immunotherapy in a clinical trial? And I'll ask this of my colleague, Dr. Luke. Yeah, so I think that this, uh, this alludes to you know, what's, what's kind of happening next in the field. And I think um, it is an exciting time in terms of considering neoadjuvant approaches. I would start by saying that I think absolutely this patient would be a strong candidate for adjuvant anti-PD-1 as a minimum. So this patient is a very high risk of recurrence, probably 50 to 70% risk. And given the hazard ratios that you alluded to for monotherapies, you can really cut that risk almost in half giving anti-PD-1. So important to point out in a uh, case like this that I think the baseline would be consideration of adjuvant anti-PD-1. Uh, now, with a palpable node, um, I think that that opens up sort of a new paradigm in our field, and there have been a lot of interesting things done over the past few years. So I don't know if you have any more further comments on adjuvant therapy, or uh, you know, I'd be happy to kind of jump into neoadjuvant. So I, I think you um, paraphrased it quite well, and even though we were focused on the hazard ratios for anti-PD-1 therapy, we see a reduction in recurrence, almost half, not quite half, which to us is very meaningful, but that also means that half of patients won't respond. Uh, despite or benefit despite getting the treatment. Uh, and we still don't know who really needs treatment. So, you know, that's also the big question. Um, but the, the neoadjuvant space seems to be uh, developing in a way where it can at least address some of those questions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to take a couple, a little bit of time and maybe talk to this idea of adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy. And probably many of you have already, you know, aware of this kind of an approach because in breast cancer, this is considered a standard approach uh, for some patients. But in melanoma, this is an emerging paradigm. Uh, and obviously, you know, on the top here in this cartoon, you can see our standard approach with adjuvant therapy, where we resect the tumor in the armpit there, and then afterwards give the treatment to try to reduce recurrence. You know, obviously, we could flip that around, as we talked about, maybe give the treatment first. Uh, and there might be good reasons to think about that prior to doing the surgery, and then stratifying what we do after surgery based on what that treatment response looked like. Uh, and so there've been a number of really high profile studies that have looked at this, um, and we're just going to highlight a couple of them, but one of them was this study, the OPASIN NEO clinical trial. And you can see that this is a multi-arm study uh, in which patients who had uh, tumors that were uh, deemed to be resectable, but were palpable, um, uh, were then randomized into these three arms. So these are going to be stage three patients where they have a node that you can feel, they get randomized then either to get the regimen here you see, a couple doses of IPI followed by NEVO, and then a couple doses of IPI plus NEVO at the same time, um, or a couple doses of IPI plus NEVO, but with the lower dose of IPI. So, and, then, and the idea there being, if we give the lower dose of IPI, maybe we get less toxicity. And then all these patients went on to have surgery. You can see that in the, in the orange box. But then on the right-hand side, you can see these rates of pathological response. And so I think what's really important to show here is that in the two arms of this trial that got nivolumab and ipilimumab, 
about 80% of patients in each arm had a pathological response, meaning the tumor shrank dramatically. Uh, and what was clear from the safety considerations is that reducing that dose of ipilimumab did alleviate the toxicity quite substantially. And this is an area in the field that uh, we don't really have a lot of time to get into in this uh, discussion uh, today, but this consideration about a lower dose of ipilimumab is becoming more pertinent, I think, and will be only more so as we kind of move into the future. So point being here is that we can treat pre-surgically uh, and get these high rates of treatment response. And we look at the outcomes for the patients on this clinical trial over time, you can see that for those patients who had a pathologic response, the outcomes were quite excellent. So realize these are very high risk patients because they present with palpable nodes. And what you can see on the left, the relapse-free survival is at a year and then at two years, almost 84%. So, you know, this is a population of patients we would have expected 50% recurrences. Uh, and so this looks quite attractive uh, in terms of thinking about the paradigm moving into the future, albeit with a caveat, this was a clinical trial, which was not a hu super huge trial, right? Um, so on the right-hand side, um, you can see the, the difference uh, between uh, outcomes for patients who have response and who don't have response. Obviously, if you give the pre treatment pre-surgically and the tumor does not respond, that you know, sort of suggests a biology of a patient that you probably need to be watching more closely uh, in the post-surgical setting because their risk of recurrence is probably gonna be higher. Now, there have been several of these trials, and again, we don't have time to go through all of them, uh, but I'm gonna highlight uh, a pooled analysis that was presented at ASCO uh, a couple, you know, last year, but now has been published in Nature Medicine, uh, in which we looked at the outcomes of patients who either got immunotherapy on the left-hand side or targeted BRAF MEK therapy on the right-hand side in the pre-surgical neoadjuvant setting. And you can see the red circles, which highlight uh, the response rate um, that we're seeing in these studies. Um, and so you can see that it looks fairly similar up front. But when you look at the Kaplan-Meier plots on, you know, below these, what you see is that with the immunotherapy, the patients who have pathologic partial, uh, pathologic partial or complete response have very low rates of recurrence. And that actually, unfortunately, is somewhat different than what you see on the right-hand side with targeted therapy, where even the people who had pathological complete response, they, have, they start to have progression over the couple of years. And so I think that this, um, this, this is uh, not quite clear. I think these data are quite convincing. Uh, and this is actually a little different than we had thought in the field, I think, dating back a few years. I mean, I think a lot of people had in their mind a few years ago, well, if you need a quick response pre-surgically, well, of course, you would give BRAF inhibitor because it'll shrink the tumor right away. And that turns out to be true, but the long-term outcomes for patients getting immunotherapy clearly are superior in the neoadjuvant setting. So again, I'd highlight these are clinical trial data. This is not a standard of care approach yet, but it's emerging to becoming quite clear that patients and the, the regimens to build off are really these immunotherapy backbones because we see for people who have major uh, partial, uh, partial or complete responses, they do very, very well out over a long period of time. One other point uh, that I'll bring up, and I really think this was an amazing trial, um, was a, a follow-up study to that Opasa neo trial with this trial they called PRADO, which was the personalized response-driven adjuvant therapy after combination IPI plus NEVO stage, three, four, uh, stage 3B C uh, melanoma trial. So a lot to say, PRADO for short. But the take-home message on this was the authors decided uh, what if we could actually avoid doing the surgery? And so... Um, Prior to performing the new, giving the new adjuvant therapy, they inserted a marker into the regional lymph node, and they then gave the new adjuvant therapy. And at the time of completing, instead of doing a full completion lymph node uh, resection as we would commonly do, they resected just that node with the marker, and then they looked at that node and asked the question: Is there melanoma in that node as a surrogate for the overall complete uh, uh, com uh, complete response? And you can see here that the rates of major pathologic uh, of pathologic response is seventy percent. And uh, low rates of grade three, four events with all patients being able to have surgery. But look at that number at the bottom. The surgeries were able to be admitted, uh, omitted in 60% of the patients uh, in the trial who were found to have response. So that's really amazing to think about. That really thinks that we can start to tailor our surgical approaches based on our response to immunotherapy in these high risk patients. So I present this really as a conceptualization of where the field is going. This is not something that we're going to do in clinical practice just yet, but I think it shows the possibility of using immunotherapy, I mean, literally to cure patients here and potentially avoid the downstream impacts of surgeries that can be morbid and of long-term toxicities associated with immunotherapies that might develop in the adjuvant or even metastatic settings.
So what's next on the NeoAdjuvant uh, platform? We alluded to this a little bit earlier. Uh, and so data at ASCO, the virtual ASCO 2021, were presented around the combination of PD-1 with nivolumab and anti-lag-3 with relatinumab. And you can see the schedule of events on the trial. I won't go through all of them. Just to note that it's 30 patients who basically got adjuvant Nevo plus Rela, as we're calling it, for two doses before going on to have a uh, resection of the tumor. You can see on the bottom there that 59% of patients had complete pathological response. And so that's important because that number now is starting to hold up pretty well to that Nevo plus Ipi combo. Uh, and you'll note that this was actually quite well tolerated treatment. So whereas with Nevo plus Ipi, we do see a substantial amount of toxicity, here, the toxicity only looks marginally greater than what you see with PD-1 monotherapy. And on the right-hand side, you can see the different differentiation of pathologic response states with complete uh, response you know, being the majority there uh, with the Navy uh, part of the pie chart. So take home uh, points really regarding our experience with immunotherapy in the resectable setting or neoadjuvant approaches um, are, are really to, on a global uh, sort of consideration, note the substantial activity that we see here in the perisurgical setting. So adjuvant PD-1 uh, is a standard of care for stage three disease, and we discussed our cases. But it, uh, as uh, Dr. Gibney noted, I think stage two trials really have the potential to change the standard of care in that setting quickly over the next couple of years. And really these developments in the neoadjuvant setting are very, very exciting. So we've seen the data for Nevo plus IPI um, showing high rates of complete response, the potential to possibly consider even eventually avoiding the surgery based on response to immunotherapy, and now these updated data for PD-1 plus LAG-3. So I would really emphasize that if you have the capacity, if you see a patient with a palpable node and there is a capacity to refer them for a neoadjuvant trial, to me that surely should be a uh, really strong consideration. Again, this is not a standard of care approach and I wanna emphasize that this isn't really ready for prime time in the same way we do it for breast cancer yet. But it's so exciting that we want people to be cognizant of where this field is going, because I think there's really a lot that we're going to be able to do over the next few years with novel treatments and honestly curing more patients, uh, you know, in this perisurgical setting. So from there, we might go on to do uh, audience Q&A. Uh, and when we're kind of looking through the questions that are coming up, you know, one of them, I think that, um, you know, uh, Dr. Gibney, you alluded to, but maybe you wanted to speak to more broadly is, you know, thinking about management of IRAEs. Does the fact that relatlimab is a new checkpoint inhibitor change how you would think about that, or, or how would you manage those toxicities? So this is still an evolving area because uh, we only have clinical trial experience. A lot of centers, including ours, had the 047 trial open, um, and this is a, a learning experience. But it is a lag three is an immune checkpoint, so we do have to think of it similarly as we do with CTLA four and PD one. And uh, we would manage it using the same standard algorithms with uh, immune-related adverse events, guidance, uh, such as from ASCO and other groups. So typically, uh, patients would be getting in combination with PD-1 drugs. If you have uh, a serious grade 2 or grade 3 event that meets criteria for holding drug and starting corticosteroids for PD-1 therapy, you would use a very similar approach, in my mind, uh, for a combination strategy like this. Uh, the re-challenge uh, with uh, LAG-3 after a serious event still is unknown how safe that is. So uh, we'll have to see where that plays out. Yeah. And so dovetailing in another question just quickly, uh, there's an, an ask about factors that predict for baseline immune-related adverse events. And so noting that that field is quite immature, I would say, and we don't have real great factors uh, regarding that. Uh, are there ways that you stratify your patients in clinic when you think about who, who's going to be able to tolerate you know, which treatments? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, and we really don't know how to predict who will have the AE per se unless they have a history of autoimmune disorder, and then we know that flare rates are in the ballpark of 30% or more with uh, PD-1-based monotherapies. Uh, so uh, really, it comes down to the um, competing uh, comorbidities, the functional status of the patient, and if you think a patient uh, would tolerate the AEs well, uh, meaning you know if they do end up with a severe immune colitis um, can you get them through it? And, and are you worried if they do have it more so than, than the average risk patient? So that might be where you tailor the therapy where you could offer PD-1 monotherapy versus combo and you would choose the monotherapy if you were concerned about the functional status or the comorbidities of the patient. Yeah, absolutely. And then just finally, there's a, an ask about, you know, these various mechanisms that we're seeing and how we're going to integrate all of these things into the clinic. And uh, for my part, I, I'm going to say that I don't know the answer to that, but it's very exciting to have this as a conceptual model of the future where we might be able to 
adapt these as we learn about biomarkers. But any final thoughts, uh, you know, Jeff, about, um, you know, how you're thinking about that moving into the future? I, I think it's a very good point. And it's going to be very complicated uh, how you choose your immunotherapy strategies. And we currently discuss at, at length whether you use PD-1 monotherapy or PD-1 CTLA-4. And if we throw into the mix other strategies, whether it's a VEGFR inhibitor plus PD-1, uh, uh, the LAG-3 plus PD-1 strategies, I think this is going to be a, a very difficult field for us to navigate without prospective studies, that there will be a lot of cross-trial comparison, which will maybe be helpful, but not conclusive on how best to manage patients. So I think, you know, in the future, if, if that's where we can head, that's where I would like it to see it. Um, right now, we're left to using patient-specific variables, how aggressive their disease is and uh, BRAF mutation status and brain metastasis as factors for deciding on which therapies to use. Absolutely. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash GZJ860. This activity is supported through educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck and Company Incorporated. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.